Hello and welcome to another Film Friday. This week is all about scanning. For the last couple of weeks we've looked at shooting film cameras and developing our own black and white film. Uh, so this week we are ready to scan. And I'd like to talk to you about my preferred way of doing this, which is using a flatbed scanner, an Epson V700. And uh, there's a modern version of that, which is a V800, which is pretty much the same. They just updated the fluorescent tubes inside to LEDs and the film mounts are a little bit better. Uh, but essentially it's exactly the same. Uh, so I'd like to explain why that's my preferred way of doing things. But first of all, uh, I'd like to talk to you about what your options are. The four most popular choices for scanning at home are using your DSLR, traditional film scanners, modern film scanners, and flatbed scanners. Using a DSLR, you can either photograph your film over a light box or use one of any number of adapters to fix it to the end of a macro lens. It can be an efficient and fast way to go, but I've never quite managed to improve on my scanner using this method and it requires macro lenses. If you have this gear and you like this idea, I've posted links to guides in the video notes so you can try it out. Next up we have traditional film scanners like the Nikon CoolScan and Kodak Pacon. These have a cult following, and rightly so, as they're industry standard machines designed for the one job of scanning film. However, they're now older machines that are no longer supported by manufacturers, which makes them a niche choice. Prices are also going into orbit, and with most you're limited to scanning 35mm. Thirdly, there's a modern crop of film scanners which range in price. I've read generally positive reviews of these Plastec models for 35mm and 120, and I think they're worth considering if you don't plan to shoot larger film. Finally, there's the flatbed scanner. This is a jack-of-all-trades scanner for documents and all kinds of film. The Epson V550 is the cheaper option and can scan 35mm and 120, whilst its big brother, the high-end V800, can scan everything from 35mm all the way up to 8x10 inch large format sheet film. What's best for you will be based on your personal needs and your budget, but for me, the versatility and value for money of the flatbed makes it a great choice. Whilst flatbed scanners are a level down from dedicated film scanners in terms of high resolution detail and tonality, they're capable of doing a way better job than many reviews will have you believe. When looking to get the highest possible quality for printing, third party advanced software and hardware is available that enables options like fluid mounting your film for marked improvements in tonality and sharpness. This is Ilford XP2, a 400 ISO film. I was able to make a 13 megapixel image for a 19 by 13 inch print that looks really sharp hanging on my wall with clear detail and tonal depth. If I'm after a higher quality than this, I'll be going to the lab to experiment. I'd like to get back to today's guide now, which is looking at getting great results from the standard Epson equipment. So your film has been developed and it's now ready to scan. With the Epson V700, you get a number of different scanning mounts which hold different sizes of film. This one here is for 135 or 35 millimeter. This one is for framed slides, 120 medium format roll film, and 4x5 sheet film. Right now we've developed some uh, 35 millimeter black and white film, so we're going to be using this mount here. The first thing to do is to take out these which uh, clamp the film in place. Now I'd recommend using some gloves because we don't want fingerprints on our film. Dust we can get rid of, fingerprints a little trickier. I've found the four strips that I would like to scan. Uh, these are cut to sixes because they fit in the, this, this uh, mount can take four strips of six exposures and scan 24 frames uh, all at once. So it's really handy to have them cut this way. You can ask the shop to cut them this way if you have color negatives uh, and you've taken them to the lab. Okay, now if you look at the, the scanning mount here, just along the bottom here, the bottom edge, there's a graphic which shows us which way round we need to be putting the film in. You can see that it's got uh, the reverse side of numbers one to six there. So we want to make sure that we load the film so that it corresponds to this graphic. This is so that the camera in the scanner scans the correct side of the film and not the reverse side. Okay, you'll notice at the end of the scanning frame just here, there are clips which hold the edge of our film down. So the idea is that you slide in 
the edge of the film there and just let it drop into place. And that will help, especially if you have film that's really curly, uh, it will help us to align this properly and get things clamped into place. So let's get everything in here. I wanna get all four strips in. Right, with those in place, you just wanna make sure they're lined up properly so that we don't pinch the edges. And then we put these clamps back into place. These push in with these two tabs at the edge where we've pushed the film in and put it under those clips. And you'll hear them snap into place. Make sure each of those snaps is, we've got them at each end and in the middle. So push those down. You can see if it's in place properly. Same with this side. A little fiddly sometimes, but you'll get there. And there we are. You can see our 24 frames are fixed in place and we're ready to scan. So your negatives are in this film holder now and they're ready to go into the scanner. I'm gonna show you the quickest and easiest way to digitize these and start to share them. So let's get going. With that in the scanner, we're gonna launch Epson Scan. Okay, so uh, if your Epson Scan software is set to full auto mode, the first thing you wanna do is put it into home mode, which is the first step to giving us some control. Under photograph, we're not scanning a photograph, we're scanning film, and in this case, it's black and white film. So we'll set that here. It's gonna give us a grayscale scan. Uh, we can set it to the destination here, we can set it to whether we want to share on screen or that we want to print it, which will give us a bigger scan. I'm going to go for printer. Uh, and the rest of this we can just leave on its default. We click on preview and it's going to look at giving us little thumbnails of all of the 24 exposures on that film. This takes a little while so I can skip ahead. So with the preview complete, you can see it's given us 24 small thumbnails here. It's seen every exposure on the, uh, on the holder, which is great. Uh, now it's gonna scan them at a resolution. If we were to click scan now, it would scan them at a resolution which will give us a high enough output for a four by six inch kind of standard photo size print. Uh, this is our settings folder for where we're gonna save the files. So if we open this up, uh, you can get it to save to just my documents or your pictures folder or you can select a folder anywhere else on your system. Um, if you were to click scan now, it's just gonna scan everything that has a checkbox. So all 24 scans would get run through at once. If you just wanted to scan one or two, or you wanted to uh, pick and choose which ones you want, we can, sorry, we'll just cancel that there. Select all and uncheck everything, and then just select whichever one you would like to scan. So for now, let's go for this one for us. And choose scan. You can probably hear the scanner warming up there. Uh, it doesn't take too long to do a scan at this size, but we'll skip ahead again and show you the finished scan. So there we go, that scanning is now finished. If we open up the folder where that file has saved and click on the scan, we can see it's given us a pretty good scan of a black and white image. And that is by far the easiest place we can start. From there, we can take several steps to improving the quality of our scans, really diving into the nuts and bolts of what the scanner's doing and how we can take control of the settings ourselves. But this is quick and easy and a great way of getting a good, uh, a good starting point on this. I hope that watching this gave you a good insight as to how to start using a flatbed scanner. Uh, now I would like to, just before I go today, take you back into the software and we're gonna come out of home mode into professional mode and just look at a few of those settings that I spoke of. This will just give us a better starting point next week when we're looking at post-processing in Photoshop uh, to prepare our image to use on social media or for print. Uh, so let's get back into it just briefly and, uh, and just cover that. Uh, you thought we were done here, didn't you? Uh, so did I actually, but uh, as I was finishing up there, I did think that it's important that I show you this one step in the software uh, just before we go ahead next week and start getting into post-processing and retouching an image. Um, because really, 
uh, this gives us a much better starting point than it would if we just use the automatic settings that we were looking at today. And it gives you an idea of one of the steps I was talking about, about how we can start to improve on the, uh, the results that we're getting out of the box with this scanner. So let's get into it. I've launched the software again. I'm going to use two frames to show you examples of what I'm talking about. It's going to be, we were in home mode before, which gave us some degree of control, but we're going to take it out of that and put it into professional mode. And that opens up a whole bunch of different options for us here. So we're going to go ahead and preview just the same way we did before. Probably hear the scanner warming up again. So our preview is done and uh, we want to just work on a couple of these frames here. So uh, oh, something I didn't show you was that you can actually rotate the frames in here to correct the orientation. Uh, and also you can command select uh, if you just want very specific frames out of the selection here. But right now we're going to uncheck all of these so it doesn't scan everything. Uh, just select this first one. And if we go into normal and take it off thumbnail, it actually allows us to crop the, uh, the frame ourselves so that we might be losing a bit of information there that we, um, that we wanted. So let's firstly uh, spin this round so it's the right way around. This is the first frame that we want to look at just down here. So I'm going to draw a marquee around this and I'm going to hit zoom on here. And what that will do is it will give us a larger preview of this uh, individual frame to work on. Now we have a much bigger preview to work from. It's way easier to see our adjustments than it would be from a tiny thumbnail. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is to stop the scanner from making adjustments to this picture that we can't recover when we go into our post-processing stage. By default, it will do an automatic exposure setting. And you can see that what's happening here is it's blown out some of our highlights in our sky and our sea spray down here. This is called clipping, uh, which you might be familiar with when you, if you overexpose in your digital camera, you'll see the highlights just disappear into white and you lose them forever. If you've shot film for some time, you'll know that film doesn't really behave like this. You don't lose information quite as, as sharply as it appears that we're losing it here in the highlights, uh, in, especially in the highlights. Um, so we kind of know that this has to be our scanner doing this. Now, if we, uh, we want to stop the, the scanner software from doing its automatic exposure. So we're just going to take a look at an overview of the settings in professional mode uh, to get us started here. Uh, the first thing we want to do is just to check our configuration. It's going to be set to automatic color control up here by default. Uh, we just want to take this off, put it on our own color management and make sure that this isn't set to sRGB, it's set to Adobe RGB and click OK. If, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry. All it means is it's basically giving us a starting point where it's not compressing anything or losing any information in the scan. Uh, now the next thing we need to do is just work our way down. These settings are fine. Image type, we are going to scan it as 48-bit color, which might seem unusual, but again, that just gives us the broadest range of information that we can start with before we make our final image. Uh, resolution. Now our final scan, we want this to be at 2400 DPI. This is the, about the highest that the, that the camera in this scanner can resolve. It's going to take a while, but it's going to give us a huge image and a good master file to work from if, if we want to do something important with this, like print it large scale later. Uh, now we're done with that. We want to look at the adjustment settings down here. This one here, auto exposure, is what's responsible for throwing away our highlights here. So we want to make sure that we override this and start to look at our manual settings, which are these along here. We're going to click on this one to bring up our histogram adjustment. You might be familiar with what a histogram is, what it represents and what it does, and you might not be. But if you're not, don't worry and don't let this kind of spook you. I'm not going to go into a lot of real depth here about what this, what this is. Uh, we can save that for another day. But I can tell you that basically this curve here represents all of the tonal information in our image. So down here we have the shadows through our mid-tones here and the highlights up here. And you can see that where it's placed these triangles is where it's kind of balancing out the image and it thinks it's doing a good job of, of giving us an overall good balance. But we want to just fix that by moving these arrows out so that they hit the ends of the curve. So that one more or less out to the very end of the, uh, the curve there. The one for our shadows, bring it in here. And don't worry that we're making the image look worse to start with because uh, we now go down here to 
our clipping, which is cutting off our values for highlights and shadows, and we can move those out all the way to each end of this line here. And then we can bump up our midtones just a little bit by dragging this across to the left. And you can see right away that whilst the image looks overall kind of muddier, uh, we've gotten all this information back in the sky. You can see detail down here in the surf now. Uh, and that's really important because if we'd just gone ahead and scanned this and sent it straight to Photoshop, we'd never have been able to recover this. It's gone for good. Whereas by doing it here, we're forcing the scanner to, to see all of our image and uh, to make sure it retains all this information. We now want to move along. We've looked at our, we've fixed up our histogram adjustment. We want to move along to our tone correction, this one here. Now, usually by default, this is kind of set to like boost the highlights up a little bit. If you've never seen one of these before, again, don't worry. Uh, you don't need to understand everything about this at this stage. I'm just going to show you what you need to do to fix the image. So really, we're just going to set this from user defined to linear. And again, that helps to bring back some of this kind of artificially boosted highlight that it's trying to give us here and give us a very flat starting point. So if this has introduced some color cast into the image, we can work our way along to the next one, uh, which is the image adjustment here. And this gives us a whole bunch more sliders and we can just pull the saturation down to zero and click close on there. We can boost our, our mid-tones up just a little bit, but we want to be careful that we don't do that too much. Because um, what we're looking for really here is if you've ever used raw images in your digital camera, you'll know that when you open up a raw image, it actually looks quite flat and not as, as vibrant as like a JPEG would straight out of the camera. And that's because it's giving you all of the tonal values that the, the camera actually sees, and it's not making any manual adjustments to that. It's leaving it up to you to do that later. Um, so whilst we've made this look a little bit muddy, We've gotten all our information back in the shadows and the highlights, which gives us a perfect starting point to go ahead and decide where we want to place contrast and tone ourselves uh, and not lose any information in this picture. The last thing that I'll show you is, is saving this. So if you were to go into here, File, Save, Settings. Under Image Format, we want to have it on TIFF and not JPEG, uh, which just, again, makes sure that we don't end up with a compressed image. And from there, uh, that's really it. We can, if we go to go ahead and go OK there and scan, that's going to give us the best possible scan that we can get of a black and white image from the Epson software to start with. So I'm just going to show you a quick before and after to show you what the adjustments we've made are. So if you look at this and then we go back to click on auto exposure here, you'll see that this is where we lost all this information and it's just, this would be no good, an unacceptable starting position for me. Um, so yeah, we can uh, we can work from this next week. Uh, just so that you can see how I've done this, I'm gonna quickly work through, uh, let's go through this the other image, which I'd like to work on next week, which is this one here. Uh, so I'm gonna follow exactly those steps that I just did with you, but I'm just gonna do it super quickly so you can see again. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So. I've just zoomed in on a preview of the other negatives that I'd like to work on next week, just to show you again these steps just really quickly. Uh, we've blown out all of our sky here. We're just gonna pull out these values on our histogram. Pull out these values here. Make sure that the curve is set to linear. Uh, boost up our brightness values just a bit. And there we go. It's as straightforward as that really. We just wanna make sure that we haven't lost any of our tonal value in this image and we've got a good starting point. So from there, I would just click on scan. You can see the before and after. So we would never have been able to recover anything from that sky. Now, all of this might seem like a lot of information, but really you can use the first part of what we looked at today to get you started and that will get you sharing and get you using the software. This uh, all comes with practice and after a while it will just become intuitive. There's, there's the same steps every time, especially for black and white. So once you've done it a couple of times, uh, you won't have a problem with this at all. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode and I hope you'll join me next week when we start to look at post-processing. Thanks for watching.